I don't wanna grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity exists Naming something doesn't mean that we get it So I'll live each day with wonder Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Adam Ghazali and Robert Strong. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. It's nice to see a big, packed audience here. We're going to dive right in, and then we're going to break it down. We're just going to start with the big overview of how a magician actually tricks your brain. So first, the magician studies how the world really works and the assumptions that you make about it. For example, a magician understands the assumptions that you make about an art pad, that it is flat, that it has many pages and weighs about a pound. Next, he knows the assumptions that you'll make about a magic marker, that it has a cap, it has ink, and it has a strong smell. He also knows that you, the assumptions that you'll make about how these two interact with one another. He can even make a few marks, and even a circle. Now he has magically made a bowling ball appear, a two-dimensional bowling ball. But it is too late, because you probably did not notice the misdirection that took place right in front of your eyes, and you probably did not notice him concealing the secret in plain sight. He is a professional liar and a cheater. <laughs> and he has already made you come to the wrong conclusions, but for the right reasons. When your brain struggles with its wrong conclusions and reality, that is where you experience magic. That was awesome. When the bowling ball hit the ground, you jumped out of your seat a little. <laughs> <laughs> Try the decaf. <laughs> so I'm Robert Strong. I'm the magician tonight. I am Adam Ghazali. I'm a neuroscientist. And in full disclosure, I want to make absolutely clear, I am not a magician at all. And I am, for full disclosure, not smart at all. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to give you a little overview of what our goals are tonight and how we're going to accomplish them. They're pretty straightforward. We want to teach you something about how the brain works and something about magic. And more interesting, really how they intersect together to yield all the amazing illusions that you have probably seen and some new ones that we're going to show you tonight. And so how we're going to do this is sometimes I'm going to talk about a neuroscientific concept. And, and then, then I'll do a magic trick. And other times, Robert is going to start with an illusion. And then he'll explain the neuroscience concepts. So that's the basic idea. And, and as Adam said earlier in the introduction, that what magicians mostly do is they exploit the assumptions you make about the world around you. You're doing it right now. For example, um, you assume that the glasses that Adam took out to read the paper are real. They're not. There's no lenses in them whatsoever. <laughs> and you probably assume that the microphone that Robert is using is real. Oh, no. It's the Shabari 3000. It's a spot massager. <laughs> for urgent situations, you can have it overnighted for a 3837 from Amazon. All right, so without further ado, we're going to drive it. We're going to dive in and talk about the brain and magic and try to put some of this together for you. Let's start with the concept of illusions. Now, it's, it's complicated because it's not really one type of illusion. There are many types, and we want to just sort of put some definitions to them to help you classify them when you, are, uh, when you encounter one. So here are two that you're most certainly familiar with. One that manipulates physics or takes advantage of physical properties, and the other that is based upon our perceptual abilities. So I'm going to give you these examples one at a time. So for physics, this is one that you probably all have seen before, is this one. 
So has anyone noticed a straw in a glass? Doesn't appear to be going straight. It could be bent. It can actually be completely broken in addition to the size difference. Has everyone noticed this? Okay, this is an illusion based on physics. The refractory properties of different media changes the speed and the direction of light as, a trend, as it passes through them. And so this is a very common one, but it doesn't rely on your brain. So a computer that had a sensor, a detector, would read out that this does look like it changes shape and direction. The other type of illusion that is quite common is what we often call optical illusions. But it doesn't have to be optical, it doesn't have to be visual, it could be auditory as well. So here's an example of one you could find, if you just search optical illusions, you could find so many of these. They're amazing. Um, and can everyone see this one going on here? I thought this one was pretty cool, right? If you focus on the middle or, and move your eyes across it, it looks like it's moving, like it has, like it's a GIF or something, a video, but it is not. It is a static image. Now, perceptual illusions are not really based on physics. They're based upon how your brain processes information and the many shortcuts that it takes that allow us to interact in this world so fluidly. Um, and this is going to be a repetitive theme. It relies on assumptions, anticipation, pattern matching, prediction. And all of these come together to create illusions that could exist in the color domain, in the motion domain, different shapes. And you probably have seen a lot of these already. So this would, you know, a computer and a sensor would say this is a static image. So this illusion relies on your brain, while this one relies on physics. Clear difference? And uh, Robert's just going to give you another example of a perceptual illusion. Here's a perceptual illusion. I need everyone to uncross your legs, put your feet flat on the ground, point your toes directly to me, uncross your arms, put your hands on your knees. Everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> Adam, I'm going to have you stand right here because they're going to look at you in a second. Okay. I need everyone to point your nose directly to the center of the spiral. Focus your eyes on the very, very center of the spiral. Use your peripheral vision to see the whole spiral. Try not to blink, but it's okay if you blink. Breathe. I will count down from 10. When I get to zero, I want you to look directly at Adam's nose. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Look at Adam's nose. Thanks. Makes me feel bad. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Next time we're gonna flip that one. Did his head collapse? Okay, if not everyone saw it, I'm gonna do it again, but I've reversed the direction of the drill so the spiral will move in the other direction and the opposite's gonna happen. So right here, Adam. Everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> Point your nose directly at the center of the spiral. Look at the black dot in the center. Try not to blink. It's okay if you do. Use your peripheral vision to see the whole spiral, but focus on the center. I'll count down from 10 when I get to one. Look at Adam's nose. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Look at Adam's nose. All right. So the second time I did it, that's how big Adam's head really is. <laughs> He's accomplished so much as a doctor and a PhD and all that. So his head looked like it grew, right? And the reason this works is when the spiral is going in one direction, the muscles in your eyes are pulling in one direction, and after a few seconds, 10, 20 seconds, it starts to fatigue. So when you look at something else, it overcompensates, increases the illusion of shrinking or growing depending on which direction the spiral is going. It's kind of like if you were to hold a heavy bag or a book in your hand for about 10, 20 seconds, then you let go and your arm flies up because the opposite muscles are just kind of compensating for how fatigued the other muscles are. Cool? And you see this with colors, too. So if you, again, go and search optical illusions, you'll see the removal of a color that you're staring at creates the opposite color. It's, it's, it's opposite appears, and it's very powerful effect. So that's optical illusions, perceptual illusions. They exist in the auditory domain as well. So let's return to our list here and talk about cognition. So this is largely the focus of the rest of our talk, cognitive illusions that, that really rely upon the higher order abilities of our brain that are manipulated 
by folks like, like, like Robert here, uh, to create illusions that are supplied in tricks or magic tricks. And this is how we really um, deliver the most clever of these of, of all. And so most that you see, that you think about in this domain, are really manipulating cognition. You don't see so many of these um, in performances like this. So what we want to do now is break down all the aspects of higher order thinking of the brain that uh, are manipulated during magic that lead to these complex illusions that you're going to see many of today. And Adam, if I just add, what a magician's basically doing in the way of cognitive illusion is I'm creating a, a false experience, a memory that's not real, that's hopefully better than reality. So that's kind of the magician's job is creating false memories, cognitive illusions. All right, so let's, uh, let's break, break this down, and we're going to go through a lot today. But one very, very critical part of all of magic and uh, of all of our lives, so we're going to constantly try to make this uh, parallel between magic and things that are important to our everyday lives. That's sort of one of our, our goals here. So is attention. Right, and you probably are aware, um, whether you're a neuroscientist or not, that attention is critical for your performance. Um, we want to go a little deeper and talk about two different types of attention, both of which are exploited in magic. So the first type of attention that we'll talk about is called bottom-up attention. Now, bottom-up attention is the more primitive, ancient attention. It is the attention that even our most ancient ancestors um, used to survive. So our survival was really critical on this attention. And what bottom-up attention means is that you focus your attention on the information from the environment that's most important to you for your survival. So things that are very bright, things that are very loud, demand your attention and independent of your goals. So you pulls you away no matter where you're focusing. Now, obviously, this is critical for survival because it took us towards food, other nutrients, moved us away from threats. And it's still part of our brains and how they work now. So we have not gotten rid of it, which is good because our survival is really dependent upon this sensitivity to the environment. So this is a frequent uh, tool that's used in magic. Do you want to so, say yeah. a couple words about so, that? So uh, magicians exploit this bottom-up concept. We're not allowed to use fire here in Palo Alto, so you have to use your imagination. <laughs> this is okay. It's a podcast. It's radio. The people there are going to see a really cool magic trick or, or hear one. So if I had flash paper, it's that ball of flame that burns up in just about a second, and I were to light a lighter, and I were to throw up a ball of flame, that would grab all your attention and focus so that I could vanish a lighter and it would create a perfect illusion because you can't help to be drawn, your primal self can't help to be drawn to the big bright light, the fire and the color and the movement. Cool, all right, so the other type of attention is what we call top-down attention. Now top-down attention is really in many ways the ability of our brain that, that most defines us as human. I think it's really the pinnacle of being a human and what has evolved that differentiates us. So top-down is goal-directed attention. It's where you pay attention based upon a decision that you make upon how you want to interact with the world. And that decision could have you decide that you want to focus on something or ignore something. So it's really always in conflict with bottom up, right? You could decide that even though there's that bell that you heard, you're going to ignore it because you want to focus your attention here. So this is something that's really highly human. Our ability to have top down attention has allowed us to do all the amazing things that we have done creating civilization and culture and language and music and technologies because we have this ability to sort of unshackle ourselves from this bond that other animals have to the environment where they're just pulled by it and cannot break it. Now, of course, it's not perfect, our top-down attention, and we're going to talk about the imperfections in it. And just a little neuroscience here. Um, this is the visual cortex of our brain. It's in the back of our brain, sort of so light comes in, moves across your brain. It's processed over here. So for visual information, this is where bottom-up processing occurs. For top-down, this part of our brain, the front part of our brain, known as the prefrontal cortex, the most evolved part of the brain, sends signals and communicates with the rest of the brain through a network, a neural network. And what this does is it allows you to weight information, more relevant or less relevant. So a rose that you pay attention to is actually in many ways more red and smells more than if you had ignored it. So this is how you sort of dictate your interaction with the environment. And this is another powerful tool that's used in magic. So to, for a demonstration, I've Robert. got a volunteer. Come on up. <laughs> uh. 
Hi. What's your name? Debbie. Gabby, what do you do for a living, Gabby? I'm no Debbie. Oh, Debbie, I'm sorry. Debbie, what do you do for a living? CFO. CFO. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> Debbie, would you have a seat right here? I got the big brain. Clearly, you have the big brain, top down and bottom up. Um, Debbie, go ahead and uh, uncross your legs, and I'm going to ask you to hold on to this roll of toilet paper, and we're going to do a little demonstration of a magic trick. <laughs> a CFO with her own roll of toilet paper. <laughs> what kind of company do you work for? Do I have to pay for this? No, you don't have to pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> Included, especially if you sponsor the Commonwealth Club. <laughs> yeah. What's the name of your company? Oh, what do they do? We're in the beauty space. Oh, beautiful. Watch very closely. I'm going to make this ball of toilet paper magically vanish. But Debbie, there's two ways I can do it. The first way is called using real magic. The second way is called using sleight of hand. Which way do you think I'm going to use? Sleight of hand. Very good. I place it in my left hand. I do a tap, tap, tap. The audience knows it's not there. It's really over here. That's the sleight of hand. Watch very closely, Debbie. Oh, no, no, keep that down here. I do a tap, tap, tap like that, and that's when it vanishes from both hands. It actually went up my sleeve. No, 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 don't find it yet. We'll get to it in a minute. We're going to do it again with a bigger ball, my CFO, Debbie. Watch very closely. I'm going to make it disappear for real, 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 or that sleight of hand. We're going to make it disappear. You come in here. You do the tapping this time. This is the tapping part. Go tap, tap, tap. That's perfect, CFO. Good. It's gone. Did you see it go up? You can, if you stick your hand up there, you can actually feel the, no, that, not, yet, not yet. We'll do it again, Debbie. Watch real closely. This time, I'm just going to squeeze like that, and it vanishes from both hands. Wait, 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 Debbie. We're going we're gonna to bring it back. I need a good magic word. What's a good magic word? Money. Money. Perfect. And just like that, it magically reappears. A big round of applause for Debbie. Watch your step. For the people watching, the, listening to the podcast or the radio, what happened was I had Debbie up here and a roll of toilet paper, and from her point of view, her perspective, it was magically vanishing. But so, <laughs> Adam helped here, and it went over her head. Yeah, and, so, you know, we consider this one as opposed to the flame, um, which captures your attention based on bottom up. This is one where you're following instructions and directions and you're set with, you have a goal that you uh, were given by someone else and your ability to follow that is actually your own worst enemy here, right? Because that's what prevents you from seeing some of this as opposed to the sleight of hand. So we think that's an example, but very often these both are occurring. There was a little bit of bottom up there as well, more in the sleight of hand ones with certain movements. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to show you, we're going to have these illusions related to these concepts in the brain, but frequently there are multiple aspects of it occurring at the same time. But that's the one we wanted to highlight there. Yeah, for the uh, top down, the reason she was able to follow those goals is because there was a CFO that's not a sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain. Sociopaths don't follow other people's cues. They don't follow, they don't have the empathy, they don't follow the cues. They don't take on the goals that you assign to them. They've got their own that are completely separate. Luckily, I found the one CFO who's not a sociopath. <laughs> yes. So Robert is going to, this time we're going to reverse the order. Robert's going to do an illusion and then we're going to break it down a bit. Need everybody to stand up right where you are. Everybody up. Excellent. Everybody do just like I do. Arms out, palms down. Arms out, palms down. Excellent. I can see you. Good. Everybody right arm on top, just like me. Right arm on top. Good. Palms towards palms. Lock your fingers together. Point your thumbs down to the ground. Actually, point your thumb. Good. Everybody take your pointed down thumbs. Rotate like me. Keep going. Okay, for the yoga instructors, get here. For the Cirque du Soleil stars, here. And for the two wizards in the audience, all the way down to here, good. And then unwind, shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. Have a seat. <laughs> all right, so let's, we're gonna use this. We're gonna use this as a jumping off point for a discussion about limitations. Now, I always like to couch this discussion with the basis that our brains are the most extraordinary structure that we know in the entire universe. And we've never encountered anything with its complexity and its amazing function, which is to create the human mind. Despite that, it has a number of very fundamental limitations. Um, I just want to work through three of them. These are three commonly used in magic um, to create the illusions that we see, the cognitive illusions. So the first is distributed attention.
So we have an ability to focus our attention. That has weaknesses too. We're going to come to that one in a little bit. But what we can't do is distribute our attention broadly, like throwing a net out into the sea. We have to make decisions about where we put our limited mental resources in space and in time. Um, and that is something that's easily exploited. You cannot absorb all the information around you, even if you feel like you're taking a very, very small percentage of it. The next is working memory. Now, working memory is not long-term memory. It's not the memories that you use to hold things um, in, your, in your brain from days and months and years. It's just the memory, sort of the online memory, the memory that you use to bridge very short instances in time. Um, a common example of it is the memory that you use if someone tells your phone number and you literally want to hold it in your head long enough just to get it into the phone, right? Which is not always so easy. There is probably an urban myth, but it seems that a phone number is the length of seven digits because that is actually the amount of digits that most people can hold in mind. That's sort of the, the working memory span. And it's a very good example because what it really does point out is the limited capacity of working memory. Now that capacity gets less and less as information gets more and more complex. So for digits, it's seven, give or take a couple, but for words, it's less, and for even a single complex object like a face, it's really only one that you can hold in mind and rehearse at any given time. So that's another area that can be exploited, is just you can't hold that many things. And then the next is even more basic than that. It's just processing speed. So your brain works very rapidly. Neurons can uh, do computations on the order of milliseconds, but when you are doing, when you have complex interactions with the world, there are multiple stages of processing that occurs, from the information going through your retina to your thalamus to your occipital lobe and then forward, and then there's the top down, the suppression or the boosting of that activity, and it just keeps adding up until it could be even a second. Now, a second is still pretty fast, but in your brain, it's actually, it's really a long time. I mean, think about what can happen in a second. Most, of, most aspects of your life it might not be noticeable, but things like driving a car or interacting with a predator, these are those moments where even delays in processing speed become very apparent. And we have uh, an illusion to highlight that last piece of it. This is the perfect example to show how magicians exploit your very slow processing speed to create an amazing illusion. The red handkerchief, Kane. <laughs> <laughs> so a simple one. And, you know, we're not breaking down every illusion, but the one that preceded this, its ability to fool you into making wrong decisions were based on a lot of these limitations. Hey, Adam, I'll do it in slow motion. Okay, good. <laughs> Was that more helpful? <laughs> All right, we're going to move on. So... Um, Again, we're going to have Robert introduce the concept that we'll be discussing with an illusion. Excellent. I'm going to come out to the audience and find myself a volunteer. So many people avoiding eye contact. This is great. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, I've got a volunteer right here. You, sir, you are perfect. Yes, come on up. A big round of applause for my volunteer. Oh. And I'm going to get you for laughing at him. Yes, 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 you, come on up. A big round of applause for both of my volunteers. Watch your step. Watch your step. Sir, what is your name? Dave. Dave, what do you do for a living? Retired. Retired, excellent. What's your name? Anita. Anita, what do you do for a living? <laughs> what did you do for a living? Both of you are optometrists. Oh my God, this is perfect. Come on over here, optometrist. <laughs> Dave on this side and your name again? Anita. Anita. Dave and Anita. Optometrist. This couldn't be any more perfect. <laughs> I'm not going to turn this into a magic cane. I'm going to make it magically vanish. It's either going to go up my left sleeve, which Anita's going to watch very closely, or it's going to go up my right sleeve, which Dave? Dave? Yeah, Dave is going to watch very closely. Make sure I got the names right. I place the handkerchief. Oh, audience, you watch the blue handkerchief. You can see which sleeve it goes in. I say the magic word. The Commonwealth Club, and when I say that in the blink of an eye, it goes up one of the sleeves. Now, Anita, did you see it go up this sleeve? Yeah. Dave, did you see it go up this sleeve? Dave, you really got to focus over here. It's this sleeve, this sleeve, this sleeve. <laughs> but we're going to make it infinitely more. Oh, stop. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down. No standing ovations yet. It's just awkward. 
Anita, yeah. we're going to make it infinitely more difficult. Take one hand, place it on top of my sleeve, one hand on the bottom of my sleeve, and don't let any handkerchiefs get up there. Dave, you do the same thing, but on the other side. <laughs> Allow some circulation, Dave. Okay, good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the vanishing blue handkerchief up one of the sleeves, one guarded by Dave, one guarded by Anita. Audiences watch this. Audience watches both sleeves. Come over here so everyone can see. Come over here. So good, good. Both atomatrists, huh? Is that how you met? Yep. It's gone. Did you feel go up that sleeve? Did you feel go up that sleeve? Let go, let go, let go. It's right here. Let go, let go, Dave. Let go, Dave. Dave. Okay, good. <laughs> it's right over here. Anita, when you're watching my sleeve, I actually put it up your sleeve. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Anita. I'm seeing Anita. Watch her step. Dave, stay right here. You thought you could go, huh? <laughs> no. Dave, uh, her sleeves were easy. They were long sleeves. I'm going to attempt to make this blue handkerchief go up one of your two short sleeves. You get to choose, but don't tell me yet. Okay. Come stand on the spot. Perfect. <laughs> Hold out your left hand, Dave. I'm going to place the handkerchief in this hand. Go ahead and ball it up in this hand so I cannot see it. Don't cheat and use that hand. Turn your hand over. You're going to try to get it all in there, Dave. I'll help out. I'll help out. Okay, just get it all as much as you can, Dave. Automatrist. That's got, no, don't use that hand, Dave. On three. I'm having so much trouble getting it in there, Dave. Good, good, good. On three, it's going to be. Okay, you got it in enough? You got it in enough? Okay. And I was trying, but I don't think I'm going to get it. Okay, Dave. We'll have to just really focus on it. On three, I say the magic word, the Commonwealth Club, and it vanishes. One, two, three, the Commonwealth Club. Is it gone? Open? No, it's still there. It's still there? <laughs> well, that's disappointing. Stay there, Dave. Stay there. Stay there, Dave. Dave, stay there. Instead, Dave, instead, Dave, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shackle you up. I'm going to shackle you up and see how long it oh, takes no. you to escape. Oh, yes. <laughs> you did that last night. <laughs> These are very special shackles, Dave. You can only find one place in the world, a very special magical place called the Folsom Street Fair. <laughs> There's a key here, Dave. I'm going to place this here. Let's hope we don't have to use that. Dave, my optometrist friend, would you go ahead and lock my right hand in there? Well, you know exactly what you're doing. <laughs> oh, now he looks familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing, but on the other side, Dave. Very good, but stay away from my watch. <laughs> Some of the jokes are just for me, Dave. <laughs> Once you lock that lock, pull it, make sure D D you're ripping all the hair out, Dave. <laughs> good. First thing I'd like you to do is I'd like you to face the audience, Dave. Keep facing the audience, but step to the left side. I'll move to the right side. Perfect. Dave, make sure I am still locked in there. Dave, in the back of the room is a great big clock. Do you see the clock? Or do you have a watch? <laughs> Welcome to Palo Alto, Dave. <laughs> Dave, still locked in there, yes? Okay, my hands are turning blue. I had trouble getting that watch. That was a tough one to get. When the second hand gets to 12, you're going to say go. So how many seconds, Dave, until the second gets to... Hold on to the key, Dave. Make sure I can't get to the key. <laughs> Dave, still locked in there, yes? Do the countdown nice and loud so people go. in the back in here... Go, I'm out of there. Don't go yet. Dave, don't go. You and your wife get some really great gifts for coming up here and letting me steal your watch. You can have a choice. You can either, either get 20% off of anything at Bed Bath & Beyond <laughs> or 500 free hours on AOL. Dave, everyone. Dave! Watch your step. All right. Um, so let's break down some of the, <laughs> the neuroscience that went on there. And it's already things that we've already talked about, right? You could see um, sort of the... the overloading of, of information processing and the different tasks that were being assigned and reoriented uh, attention against will and missing lots of important details. But there's another aspect that occurs constantly when we interact with the world. And I'm going to take you through this random picture 
truly that I found online to break this down. So let's take the subject of our discussion here is this gentleman. Now, this is the story of top-down and bottom-up, but presented differently than I did before. Now, his goal, his top-down goals are to focus on this conversation, which is his family that he's enjoying a glass of wine with, right? So if he has any hope of having a meaningful interaction, of remembering any of it, this is where his attention should be. And his family, it looks like they're having like a serious conversation and, you know, they're really involved in it. But his attention is not there, as you can see. It's directed elsewhere in the room, over here, where there seems to be a bottom-up source of information that's strong enough to pull these other um, attentional um, focus from around the room towards it, right? So this is a good example. His top-down goals should be here, but the bottom-up is strong enough that he is missing uh, where his focus should be attending. But if you notice this woman over here, although she's physically closest to it, her top-down goals are to her text message, right? So that she seems completely oblivious to this. Now, it's interesting because everyone has in this room a certain number of goals and a certain exposure to the same environment, but their reactions to it are very different. And what we think about this in the neuroscience world is this concept of interference. That we don't get to just have a goal and carry it out or top or bottom up information doesn't happen to have the ability to manipulate where our attention is equally. And that's because these are imperfect systems. Now, interference is something that you're very familiar with. Interference occurs, you know, like when you're, I mean, maybe in the old days, you listen to a radio, you try to tune it in, you have noise, noise, and then signal. That type of interference where you're trying to get the signal, but the signal could be lost in the noise, happens in our brains all the time. Now, there's really two main categories of interference, at least how I view this topic. It can be externally um, mediated, so the outside world can introduce interference with your goals or how you are trying to carry something out, or it could be internally mediated. And within each of these domains, there's two other types of interference. So let's start with external. It could be what I just define as distractions. So distractions are completely irrelevant information that you are aware is irrelevant and you're trying to ignore it. You have one goal. Let's say your goal is to have a conversation, and that occurs, and then you're pulled away from it. You know it's irrelevant, you want to ignore it, but you're either capable or not, and there's usually like a gray area of how capable you are. If it happened again, you might have a better chance, but it still could get in. We call those distractions. The other type of interference, which is just as common, probably more so, is what we refer to as interruptions, or multitasking. This is where you have more than one goal, and the deluded belief that you can actually carry them both out at the same time. <laughs> it occurs all the time. Now, this type, our research, and we've done many uh, experiments inside MRI scanners with EG, where we're looking at brain activity while we expose people to a goal and then present them with distractions or present them with a secondary goal. Both of these degrade performance, but interruptions and multitasking degrade it even more so than being distracted. Now, the fascinating thing about this is that all of this can occur without any information from the outside world. It can all occur within your own brain. So, for example, you can have distractions that we often refer to as mind wandering. So this is irrelevant information, just like that bell was irrelevant, but it starts inside your brain. You don't want it to be there, but it's there. These are very often, data has shown very often, mind wandering is negative things in your life that pull you away. So there you are trying to have a serious discussion with your boss and your mind just keeps going back to, let's say, an altercation you had with your significant other, right? That's a pretty common one. It's strong, it has a lot of emotion. You definitely don't wanna be thinking about it right now, but you can't help it. It's irrelevant information, so it's a distraction. These can be minor, or they could be really, really high level and pathological. So for example, this sort of defines the whole concept of post-traumatic stress disorder, where there is such a powerful 
um, emotional event in your past, a memory, that it arises and completely debilitates your ability to carry out goals in the regular, in the everyday world. So this can be very minor or it could be very, very debilitating. And then of course, you can multitask internally. So you could be having a conversation, but internally multitasking. So while you're talking to someone, you're thinking about where you're gonna go for dinner later that night. And you probably know just from your own experience of interacting with the world that these types of interference are um, the types of ways that degrade your performance. And what we've now shown is that this occurs across every aspect of cognition. So for how you perceive the world around you, to decisions that you make, memories that you have, both in the long term and the short term, and even your emotions and your compassion, your empathy. Studies have shown even having a cell phone at a table near you even if it's not yours, but if it's visible, can degrade the connection, the emotional connection that you're having with someone you're talking to. So they could be very subtle, they could also be quite dramatic. And these impairments in our cognition then cascade across every aspect of our behavior in the world. Some of them have been you know, brought to the public awareness in dramatic ways, like texting and driving, right? So how this interference uh, degrades your ability to, um, to uh, engage in, in situations where you have to respond very rapidly. But sleep, relationships, work, study, all are impaired by interference. And interference is a very, very common tool that a magician will use. So in that last example, there were many, many examples of that, both external interference, internal interference, when you're thinking about something that has now prevented you from noticing something occurring outside. So we're gonna come back to interference. It's a big part of how our brain works. It's a big uh, conversation right now of how we diminish interference, technologies, disruptive, impact on our brains often have to do with interference, but it could be used in a fun way as you just saw. So we're now gonna move on to a new illusion and use this to introduce a new concept. Who knows what this is? A TARDIS from the TV show Doctor. Doctor who is a time, time lord, time traveler, who travels through time and? And this is larger on the? So your brain actually lives in the future. It's always predicting what comes next. If I were to go for a high five and you aim for where my hand was at the moment I was going for it, you would miss my hand. So you're living in the future and we both move to meet a hands for a high five or a fist bump. Same with this. That's why you can finish my sandwiches. sandwiches. Okay. <laughs> so this is a visual example of how magicians exploit the fact that your brain lives in the future. Adam's going to talk about it after this illusion, but where are my Whovians in the audience? Excellent. Would you pass this back to this young Whovian back there? Thank you, Phil. Third row right there. It is a bank. There's something on the inside. It's currently locked. Don't try to open it. Yet. Because you don't have the key. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, now I need to borrow a $100 bill. Let me check Dave's wallet. <laughs> he doesn't have a $100 bill. <laughs> Who's got a $100 bill that I can borrow for an illusion? You've got one, someone back there? I see, I see someone moving. Are you going to hand it to the young person there? Or are you going to bring it up yourself? Oh, we got one. Oh, I know you. I want to get someone from someone I don't know. Yes, come on up here. A big round of applause for the money. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having a $100 bill. Come on up on stage. There are steps over there. I'm just going to keep talking so the podcast people think something interesting is happening. <laughs> Hi. What's your name? Uh, Su Yen. Su Yen, what do you do for a living? Uh, I'm an investor. An, an investor. <laughs> <laughs> Have you met my friend, the CFO, Debbie? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Su Yen, show everybody the $100 bill. Yes. Take the magic marker, Su Yen, and write your name nice and big on the Benjamin Franklin side. Yes, real big, Su Yen, so the people in the back row and the people at home on the radio can see it. <laughs> now, Su Yen, keep going. It's a federal fence to write on money. <laughs> 
Everybody tweet hashtag free Su Yen. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Stuff. We don't do drugs here at the Commonwealth Club. <laughs> Su Yen, show everybody what you did. Now, Su Yen, this is a demonstration of how magicians distract you, how they add interference, how the brain lives in the future. Su Yen, you've got a very important job. Keep your eyes on the money. Because you're human and you've evolved to follow social cues, you have empathy, you'll get distracted. It's going to happen. You can't help it. it but try to keep your eyes on the money. Good. So yeah, and I take the target and I make it a smaller target since you're so good. And then I make it a smaller target and even a smaller target, and it's clearly in the hand that's not moving. We've evolved to follow things that are moving towards our eyes and away from our eyes. Sometimes we forget to keep our focus on the target. If a lion or tiger came charging into the room, Su Yen, you would prioritize that over the money. <laughs> if the tiger was looking at me, you'd feel pretty relaxed, but if the tiger looks at you, you run, yes. <laughs> So put all your focus and intention on the money because I will distract you or misdirect you, Su Yen. Follow me, Su Yen. <laughs> Do not take your eyes off of your money, Su Yen. Come around this way so everybody can see you also. Now, Su Yen, I have an envelope. Let me get it out. And I'm going to take your $100 bill and I'm going to place it inside the envelope, concealing the target, helping me as the wizard to do the illusion. It goes in, you can watch from the front or back, and then I seal it, Su Yen. Awkward. <laughs> now, Su Yen, so you know that this envelope has your money on it, I take a white grease pencil and I place a big X on it. And the reason I do that, Su Yen, is because I have two other envelopes that don't have X's on it. Let's go back to the center, Su Yen. Do not take your eyes off the target. I shuffle the envelopes making it nearly impossible to know which one <laughs> has the $100 bill, Su Yen. Okay, Su Yen, point to the envelope that does not have the cash. Does not. Does not. Ooh, I like that confidence. Good. That's good, Su Yen. That's very good, Su Yen. The reason I asked you to point to that one is because that doesn't have the $100 bill, so we shred that one. I think Su Yen's gonna pay very close attention now. <laughs> Two envelopes left, Su Yen. Oh, not there, whoa. <laughs> Fool me once, shame on me. <laughs> Fool me twice, circumcision. <laughs> okay, Su Yen, two envelopes left. I shuffle them. So even I do not know which one has the $100 bill. With all the confidence in the world, Su Yen, point to the envelope. Ooh, look at that confidence. <laughs> Are you enjoying the show, Su Yen? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you were. <laughs> <laughs> it's for art. <laughs> Su Yen, open up the, the envelope, show everybody has a $100 bill, take it out, show it to everyone, get the thunderous applause you deserve, and then we'll do something amazing. Take it out, show it to everyone. Thunderous applause. Are you serious? Right, one second, Su Yen. You got to go to the corner, the other corner. <laughs> we say the magic words, I'm sorry. <laughs> and we try again. Su Yen, take out another $100 bill. <laughs> One second, Su Yen. That didn't work how I expected, so you get a gift. Would you like 500 hours on AOL? 20% off Bed Bath & Beyond or a new car? $100. When I just, <laughs> you're supposed to say the new car. Oh, a new car. No, not a card. Yeah, yeah. A, a new car, new car! <laughs> Su Yen, this is not an ordinary new car, it's a DeLorean. From the movie? So that means this is a time? It has a key, if only we had a TARDIS. <gasps> Su Yen, 
Your $100 bill is safe and sound as we travel back through time in that TARDIS. Pass that TARDIS forward. Hand it to Su Yen. Su Yen, you unlock it. Open it up. Take out the money bag. Inside that money bag is a $100 bill. Uh, before you do it, you, sir, with your arms crossed. Yeah, you haven't been on your phone once this show. Thank you. <laughs> What's your name? John, we need some fuel source. We need to compost something with a lot of energy, a lot of sugar. Give me a dessert, nice and loud. So we're going to compost a Twinkie banana flavored to get enough energy to go back in time and save Su Yen's $100 bill. Place the key in the keyhole. Turn it 90 degrees clockwise. Open the top like a treasure chest. Take out the money bag. Show everybody inside that money bag is your $100 bill, Su Yen. Twinkie banana flavored. <laughs> It was a miracle. <laughs> Thank you, Sue Yen. Thank you. That's it. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Do you know what's inside Twinkies? No. Cake, cream filling, and a $100 bill. Pick one side, open it up, Sue Yen. Just a little bit. We don't want to make a mess here at the. Uh, Good, good, that's good. I'm going to reach inside, covered in cake and cream filling, ladies and gentlemen. It's a tiny little green piece of paper. There it is. You grab it. Pull it out from the center. No way. A hundred dollar bill is inside that. It has one name on it, Su Yen. Is that your handwriting? Su Yen. Su Yen. Su Yen. Su Yen. This is a magic wipe, since you got Twinkie all over it. And I sell them after the show for $100. <laughs> a big round of applause for Su Yen, everyone! Great, so we're going to uh, sort of wrap up a lot of the things we talked about. There was a lot packed in there, but a lot of it comes down to this concept of assumptions, right? You might have seen these before. It's still amazing to me every time. Um, but this is the essence of what you've just seen, is this concept of, you know, the fundamental concept of how our brain really interacts with the environment that allows it to live in the future, is its pattern matching ability, the connections, the predictions, filling in the spaces. This is essentially what allows us to move so fluidly through the world, but it's often erroneous. And this creates illusions that occur in real life and the ones that you saw expertly delivered by Robert today. So we want to talk a little bit more about this concept of assumptions. And there's another idea that we've been uh, talking about frequently. We're now exploring this inside our laboratory at UCSF, but it plays a big part in illusions as well. This is the idea of sensory synchronization. So that's a fancy big term. What does it mean? It means that when we interact with the world, all the sensory stimuli around us don't come in haphazardly. I mean, sometimes they do. Sometimes there's a sound over here and a light occurs there and they're not occurring at the same time. But when they're synchronized, meaning that when they occur at the very same time, our brain does something very unusual and interesting with that. It does another fancy process called multi-sensory integration. What does that mean? It means that if you see and hear something, even if you smell or feel it, if they occur at the same time, we process, our brain processes that information differently than if only one of those occurred. So if you look at the visual part of our brain and give someone visual information, you see what the response is, you give them that exact same visual information, but now you pair it with a sound and the visual part of our brain, the visual part of our brain acts differently, not just the sound part, the auditory part. So what does this mean? It means that our brain is integrating information really based upon the fact that they occur synchronized. And synchrony can occur in different domains. It could be in space and it could be in time or in both. Now what happens when you have sensory synchronization and this physiological phenomenon in our brain known as multi-sensory integration, it creates something known as the unity effect. 
And what that means is your brain makes an assumption, interprets it, that these events, these stimuli that are occurring together are part of the same entity. We take it for granted, but this is essentially the basis by which we establish constructs in the world, really the basis of reality, sort of the idea that perception is reality. So the fact that there are people and places and time is all because of the synchronization of information and this property of integration that occurs. And it is powerful, so powerful. So there are examples from illusions that we're not gonna do here, but we'll tell you about them. So the ventriloquism effect. Everyone familiar with ventriloquism, right? So what makes it so amazing? You know that wooden head is not really talking. Right? But it's fascinating every time. It's fun to watch. Not because you believe that the head is actually talking now. It's because of this phenomena is so strong. So what's happening with ventriloquism is the ventriloquist is basically making a, a sort of delay, a jitter in space synchronization. So normally a voice comes out of your face, out of your mouth. You could localize the source there. Now it's moved in space, but the timing is so perfect that your brain still believes that it's being generated by this source, even though it's different in space. There's another really cool illusion known as the rubber hand illusion that also exploits this. Who's familiar with that one? We were going to put up a video and have you watch it here, but you could easily go home and amuse yourself tonight on Google and search rubber hand illusion, and it is a hilarious one. So basically, this is how it works. You put your hand down. There is um, a blind preventing you from seeing uh, your other hand, right? So your hand is over here, and then the, a rubber hand is put in your sight. So your real hand's here. There's a rubber hand here. You can't see your real hand. And the person conducting the illusion will take um, a brush, and rub it along your hand at the exact same time that they rub it along this rubber hand. So synchrony, but now it's synchrony in time because it's doing it at the same time, but now it's tactile, right? It's in the feeling domain, not visual or auditory like it is with ventriloquism. And this is going on and you're looking, this is clearly a rubber hand in front of you, but because of the synchrony between you f actually feeling it and, it and seeing it, what happens is after a while, the person leading the solution will take a hammer and slam that rubber hand and you will jump across the room <laughs> as if it was your hand. So the, again, this illusion is taking advantage of, of sensory synchronization and your brain is fooled into believing that that's your hand even though you know it's not. It doesn't matter, you still respond to it. So this is another tool that's used in really high level, very complex, sort of like the pinnacle of many of these illusions um, that really exploits this, this very, very basic phenomenon of our brain. And I think Robert's yeah. gonna give one example yes. of this. So as Adam was saying, the uh, assumptions that you make, the connect oh. the uh, connections you make the uh, filling in the gaps sorry living in the future and all that these are all shortcuts that your brain makes to save time and energy your brain's really small and not a lot of processing so it has to do you hear that oh there you go. <laughs> it's actually uh, sound synchronization it's a plastic cup but what's really cool <laughs> What's, what's really cool is even when you know it's a plastic cup and you see me place it under my arm, and I go, do you hear that? Uh, <laughs> you so react like it's a neck crack thing, but it's just this. Yeah. <laughs> these are, they, I find these really special because it doesn't matter if you know about them. So anyway, thanks, Robert, for that nut cracking. <laughs> neck cracking. <laughs> All right, I think um, we're going to close out with a couple of more. Just yeah. that, that sort of, so we told you about a lot of things and sort of one of the frustrating things is we're not breaking down every single one of these and telling you, you know, which aspects are being used. But we gave you all the ingredients to figure it out. So we're going to do a couple classic ones and see if you could figure them out given all the neuroscience that you've now been exposed to. Okay, uh, yeah, sure, I'll do something, Adam. <laughs> uh, let's do this. Oh, I'm so excited to do this. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a green box. It's a prediction. Would you hold on to the green box, but do not open the green box? This, ladies and gentlemen, is a Rubik's Cube, my childhood. Did anybody else waste their childhood learning how to solve a Rubik's Cube? Can you solve, a one, solve one, my Whovian friend? I want you to do, stand up, do the opposite of solving it, put it behind your back and mix it up as much as possible. 
Now, there are 350 million Rubik's Cubes in the world. Only half of them can be solved by their owners. People that are good at solving it, yeah, can solve it in about 30 seconds is the average. The AI robots, uh, the limitation was about 14 to 16 seconds, but recently one just solved it in like 1.5 seconds. So I have not updated my script for the new AI that solves in 1.5 seconds, but I'm going to attempt to solve that Rubik's Cube in the same amount of time as a robot with AI, 14 to 16 seconds, but I will do it blind. Would you hand the Rubik's Cube forward and somebody in the front row place it into my hand? I won't look. Let me know when you're close. What I do is without looking, I take the Rubik's Cube, I place it into the bag, and in 14 to 16 seconds without looking, I solve it blind. Now, there are 42.3 quintillion possible combinations in a Rubik's Cube. Am I getting close? No, no. okay. 42.3 quintillion. We're not talking about millions or billions or trillions We're talking, or, or quadillions. We're talking about quintillions. Am I close? No, okay. That is more than there are grains of sand on the planet Earth. That's more than there are stars in the known universe. That is more than there are seconds since the Big Bang. You made an assumption that I was solving it for sameness. <laughs> but I wasn't. I was solving it for likeness. Open up the little green box and hand me what's on the inside. I hold completely still in the light, ladies and gentlemen. That is one solved side. That is two solved sides, three solved sides, four solved sides, five solved sides, six solved sides, seven solved sides. <laughs> Sit down. So what I think we'll do is we'll take questions for a few minutes and then I'm gonna teach everyone an illusion at the end, something you do. So uh, there are microphones, uh, stage right and stage left. Go ahead and line up, and it's really important you talk loud and slow and clearly directly into the microphone. I will answer just about any question you ask, except how magicians do tricks that you can't do. <laughs> Meaning, if it's something you can do at home right now with the skill and things you have at home, I will tell you. But if it's somebody else's and you can't do it without the props or the skill, I will not share that. Say your name. Hey, my name is Suyash. Uh, love the magic and the theory behind it. My question is for Professor. The uh, chart you showed was kind of scary where there are distraction and in interference and all of that going on in the brain, internal, external. I'm curious what can we do to uh, stay focused at the job in today's age when there are phones and watches and people in the open office environment pinging you all the time? Yeah. It's a, it's a great question. It's one that um, a lot of attention has been applied to. Um, you know, sort of going back um, over the last decade or so, uh, at least the data would suggest that this problem is getting worse. Um, most people are starting to hone in on the fact that despite technology offering us so many wonderful solutions, it has overloaded a lot of our processing, not in a dissimilar way from what we use for illusions and magic, that we have very limited resources, the limitations we talked about, and they can be overrun. And so, I mean, it's a long discussion about how you um, manage interference, I would say there's a couple things. The first is to be informed about it. Um, and I wrote an entire book on this called The Distracted Mind where I rip apart all those details that you saw here and just with the goal of trying to tell you what they are because I think that if you are going to change your behavior in some way to manage interference better, it's really critical to know what the challenges are in the first place. It doesn't mean you're gonna solve them, but I think being informed is a big step forward. And so once you know that your brain has limitations in its processing speed, that you really can't multitask effectively without degrading your performance on both tasks, the fact that we're subject to bottom-up influence and distraction from vibrations and buzzes and beeps, and that's why they are in our technological tools in the first place, to pull your eyeballs away. Once you recognize all that, them, you at least have the opportunity to manage them. Doesn't mean you're going to do so successfully, 
But I mean, this is pretty common type of approach across many aspects of behavioral change, whether it's diet or dealing with sun exposure. You recognize that you need to modify your behavior in some way, and then you go about the really challenging but critical task of forming new habits that allow you to interact with your world in a more healthy manner. Now, I personally am not one that subscribes to the idea of getting rid of all technology. I don't think that that is a very... Um, fruitful uh, piece of advice. Um, and I know it is even more complicated for children, and it doesn't mean that I don't uh, subscribe to taking a break or even you know, a short detox, but getting rid of it completely is unlikely to be a solution that's practical for most people. So to me, it really comes down to learning how to take control of it and not having it control you. So first being aware that you are often controlled by it. You're making decisions that are not being guided by your top down, that being guided bottom up. So being aware of when things you're doing are bottom up versus top down is an important step. And then it's really restructuring how you use technology. So I usually like, you know, another important thing is to realize that multitasking is not bad. It's not like inherently an evil thing to do. Just like being in the sun is not inherently evil. Or eating a dessert is not. You just have to make an informed decision about when you do it. And so personally, if I'm doing something that really demands very high quality, that has like a time stamp on it, then I will single task. Like literally shut down my email, quit a browser, put my phone on airplane mode, close my door, and actually single task. Because data would suggest that is how you're going to obtain the highest quality in the shortest amount of time. Now, that may conceptually make sense, or theoretically, or even you know, empirically based upon our research, but when you start trying to do that, what you'll find is that it's really hard to do. We've gotten in habits of constantly interrupting ourselves. And so how I advise people to do it, just because this is, I'm not really a self-help guru or anything like that, but I've had to figure it out my, myself as well, you'll start with like, okay, I'm gonna have an hour of single tasking. And realize that you can't actually single task for an hour very well at all. I mean, that's, that's not very subtle. Um, you'll feel this increasing sensation of anxiety. That anxiety could be FOMO, fear of missing out. That anxiety could be performance anxiety, like, wow, if I was doing three things right now, it'd be better, even though we just told you it's not better. Um, <laughs> or it could be boredom. We have a very low tolerance to boredom now, especially. Even waiting online at the checkout for like the 20 seconds until you're next, you just pull out your phone and automatically go in there, right? Because you could pull in some external information as opposed to being in your own mind and your own thoughts or even looking around the store. So the increase in boredom, the anxiety uh, through those different sources prevent us from making it through an entire hour. And that's okay. I would say first start with just 10 minute intervals. If you can't do that, five minute intervals. And in those intervals, when you take a sort of break from single tasking, I would advise not to go on social media or your email because these become these iterative sinks that just take you farther and farther away. So some mindfulness, just quiet relaxation, looking at nature, some physical fitness, you know, doing some push-ups, and then get right back into it and try to get through the hour. Keep extending the amount of time that you go. Sort of like you're training for a marathon. Your goal is just to focus on one thing for an hour. And it's sort of like a marathon, you will see. And then once you do that, you set aside time during your day to single task, and then other times to multitask, where you're doing a lot of things that are low level, that are not critical, multitask away, right? Listen to music, jump on social media. It doesn't matter. Those things can handle the fact that they're going to be degraded in performance. So that's uh, sort of how I go about it. Now, now Adam, you uh, were talking about... Thank you. <laughs> you talk about changing habits, maybe habits for long-term, things for health and all that. Do you have any personal stories of anything you've changed in the last few months? And how do you make long-term changes? Oh, I changed my diet. Yeah. Yes, yes, I lost 35 pounds this year, um, which was pretty, pretty impressive. Um, you know, I turned 50 and I was like, this is the time, right, to declare what I'm going to be, you know, for the next 50 years. And um, I've got three years before I have to declare that. Yeah, good, good. You okay. have plenty of time, plenty dessert, of uh, dessert. donuts. What are those? Yeah. Anyway, um, no, so, you know, it's, it's basically the same approach that I use to the single task, multitask, is that, you know, you baby step into it, change, you know, just one meal, change just your lunch, stick to that, say, got lunch down, going to decrease the portions in dinner, um, and really just, you know, slowly build a new habit. I actually, I, I never even told anyone this. I, I just recently started uh, testing this, how hard it is to break a, to, to form a habit, let's say. So 
you have your, your morning routine in the bathroom, right? You brush your teeth, I don't know, you put something in your hair, maybe you put contact lens solution in. Try doing a set order every day. Just try like, or switching an order that you do and watch how hard it is. Every day you're like, oh, I was supposed to moisturize first. And you'll see that even something as simple as that is really hard to do. Like setting new habits are tough. But after like a week, you're like, oh, I got it. I'm brushing my teeth first every day. So you could challenge yourself in little ways and start understanding how susceptible you are to not being able to break a habit of forming a new one. But it's really baby stepping into the process. Cool. Got a question that I can answer? Yeah, for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I can't uh, do magic, so I have to do something. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. If you ever get, do you ever get caught on stage if you like, for example, stealing a watch or someone notices something that you have? Um, what do you do and, or does this not happen? Are you a magician? Uh, yeah. I'm not going to answer that. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's a really good question, thank you for asking it. And so yes, you get caught. So if you're doing uh, an illusion, a grand illusion, uh, some big name magician, maybe like Cavett Dopperfield. Um, <laughs> ah, yes, my favorite. So a lot of times they're not perfectly angle proof. So there might be like 2% of the audience on this side and 2% of the audience on this side that it's revealed to, but it's enough mm -hmm. to kind of get the reaction. Um, if you see some of the, the psychological experiments that they do to test neuroscience, like switching a person uh, for change blindness during a blink, um, really only about, you know, 50% of the people are fooled by that. So the video they show are the 50% that they get, and they just cut out the other ones. So um, when I'm on stage, I would say 5% uh, of the people will not be fooled by an effect that's kind of on average. And the reason is, is if you got a magic set as a kid and you got something in there that was really, really grade A cool, you will always see that for the rest of your life if a magician uses that. But if you've never gotten that cool thing in that magic kit, you'll never see it even though it's right in front of your face. It's rumored that uh, Harry Anderson used a silver one on television because he knew that people weren't looking for it, wouldn't expect to see that obvious thing that's right in front of your face. So to answer the second part of your question, do I get caught? I had a heck of a time with David's watch. I thought I was gonna get caught. I didn't get caught. Um, I got away with it, I think, or he was being kind. But when you do get caught, uh, one of the things you can do is you weigh the, the things, can you bluff your way out of it? Can you pivot to a different trick that's going to be just as amazing, or you just go for complete honesty? Wow, I was trying to steal your watch. I totally failed that one. Let's move on. And the audience can actually relate to it because it's the real person thing. They can relate to, oh, how is he going to get out of this situation? Oh, he was cool about it. He was able to just let it go and move on. I wish I could just let things go and move on. It takes years and years of just... <laughs> Just like putting it behind you and pretending until you really just kind of move forward. And, uh, and one more answer to that is um, there's in magic, there's something called outs. So for every possible situation that comes up, I've got an out. And when a new, new one comes up, uh, I create an out for it. So when that comes up again, I've got an out. Um, like when they didn't pick the uh, AOL or the 20%, that's never really happened. So now I'm going to go home and write a joke for when they pick neither. <laughs> And, and I had never gotten Twinkie before, so Robert, thanks a lot. <laughs> Robert, maybe just a little riff on that one. Do you find it like different audiences are either more or less susceptible? Like I heard that uh, an audience that's intoxicated, that if you're like doing this at a bar and people are drinking, that they have a different susceptibility or to, to either not notice it. There are three types of people that are difficult to fool. Uh, the reason we're able to trick or fool people is because they follow social cues, they have empathy. So the first one is really little kids who haven't learned the social cues. Um, when you point and look somewhere, they don't follow that social cue because <laughs> they, they look where they want to look. Yeah. yeah. Drunks, their inhibitions are gone, so I try to, when I'm working an event, I love working for a group that's had one drink or two drinks, but three drinks, not fun for the magician at all because they'll look over and they'll go, you gotta see this magician, and they turn back and the ones turn to hundreds, and they go, where's the trick? You just switched them. <laughs> and the third type is sociopaths, like CFOs. <laughs> yeah. Um, they, they tend, to, so not CFOs, but sociopaths tend not to follow social cues, and it's very easy for me to pick them out of a group. When I'm doing a magic trick and I'm directing focus and attention, the other person is just staring me in the eye with a look like, 
I, I know I've got somebody who is lacking empathy. Yeah. So, so there's like a ton of neuroscience here that we won't break down. But as you probably know, children don't have top down until they're older, sometimes even into the late 20s. And... <laughs> Um, and that causes all levels of stress for parents around the world. And, but that's really, you know, if you don't have top down or it's very low, you know, children are bottom up directed. They might have a goal. They see some candy, they have a whole new goal, right? And that is problematic if your trick relies on manipulating top down systems. And same thing with, uh, with intoxication. It changes the level of inhibition and, and alters interference patterns in such a way that it changes how you interact with it. Actually, when we were putting the slides together in the different types of illusions, so everyone, uh, including computers with sensors, sees the physics-based ones. Everyone sees the straw, 100%, and a computer would, all, a robot would also agree with you. On the perceptual ones, a computer would say that thing is not moving, but everyone will, including people that are intoxicated, including sociopaths, including children, because it's such a basic aspect of how your brain works that it's common across all of us in all sorts of different states. But then the cognitive ones is where you see that not everyone re reacts uh, in the same way. And all those differences tell you a lot, not just about what magic is best to perform to what audience, but how the brain works as well. And there are people that use these illusions as jumping off points to answer uh, neuroscience questions. Any investment questions for Su Yen? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so through the ages, magicians have been enormously creative at developing folk knowledge and folk wisdom about how the mind works, essentially. And now that's turned into scientific study with you know, lar much larger scope and deeper knowledge. Um, and you've shown how scientific si science can explain or account for much of what happens in the magic. Does it work in the other direction? So when you guys get together and you learn about some of the formal science, do you create new illusions, new ma magic tricks that you might not have thought of and no musician would have thought of without the insights that you get from the fuller scientific knowledge of how the mind works? Yeah, I, I think it goes in both directions. Thank you for that question. It's a good question and I'll, I'll think about it some more afterwards. But um, anecdotally, what I've heard is that magicians have been doing it for, for I want to say centuries, maybe even millennia. And uh, neuroscientists took some time to say, well, magicians already hacked this. Let's study how magic works. And every time I learn a concept, I go, oh, I can take something and make it smarter. So yeah, I would say yes to that. And I'll, while we're answering more questions, I'll think if there's anything specific. But even just writing the script when he's saying top down, bottom up, and I'm trying to track a magic trick to it, it um, helps me create more. Um, this whole kind of script, ah, I've got the perfect example, this whole script with the TARDIS living in the future, it's a time machine. Uh, the brain lives in the future, that's how magicians fool you. Uh, they follow social cues, it's a shortcut through evolutions. All that whole routine came from uh, us doing a talk five and six years ago, and that kind of sank in and changed what that became. And the DeLorean got at it, the TARDIS the got at it. synchronization, all that was new, multi-sensory integration. Um, so that's something that we are very interested in in our research to understand that. And when we were talking about it and the ventriloquism effect, he's like, oh, I have one of those in mind, the, uh, yeah. the cracking. So, yeah, I think there is a cool uh, back and forth that occurs, certainly in, in us trying to figure out how to uh, educate and entertain you today. There was a lot of back and forth. Yeah, and the, the sound synchronicity, synchronicity yeah. sound, synchrony, that word? Um, <laughs> synchronization. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it got me thinking about how in magic we will um, add provers. The provers will guide you away from the secret and adding sound at the right time to kind of prove something coming from a slightly different location could be really, really cool. So I was starting to think about how I could prove something that's not real by adding sound or tactile touch at the right moment in almost the right space. Yeah. Okay, good, mic adjustment. Um, so how does being a magician change magic shows that you view for you? Okay, yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Are you I, a magician? I feel, I feel bad, yeah, um, kinda. <laughs> I've performed magic shows, so I guess. Okay, do you have a website? No. Damn, okay. <laughs> uh, did you have a question for Adam also? Or, or more, no, just, just how does I it just, change? I just feel bad because he hasn't been asked many questions. <laughs> Don't, don't feel bad for him at all. 
It was worse when everyone was laughing at my face, believe me. <laughs> Once you start so, with that, you can't really go down. So, it, But that was cool, wasn't it, to be up yeah, here and see? Yeah, it's sort of interesting feeling. So, you know? so being a magician watching magic shows changes it drastically because it's, it's hard not to see how it's done. Once you know that uh, a method exists, it's kind of impossible not to see it. So um, I watch it differently. I watch for uh, the character, the story, the uh, costume, the lighting, the sound, the movement, the staging, the, the choreography. I watch it for um, the twists and turns, how they've adapted it to make it their own. Um, so I can know how a trick is done. Do you do the magic coloring book? Do you do the magic coloring book trick? No? Um. No. It's a good one. I could watch the Magic Coloring Book, something I've known for 35 years, and go, oh, wow, that was really clever how they interacted with the audience or how they uh, used a language that was really connecting with this group. So, Oh, actually, I think I've seen it. So you see, it's really cool. I, I, I think I figured it out. <laughs> Security! <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Wait, but I, wait, my name's not Michael, it's Avi. Just for the sake, I, I need to make that clear. So I, just, I need security, the proper fame. Security, Avi, Avi's here. Security, thank you, Avi. Oh, I thought it was Michael. Okay. Are we doing oh, another, like that? Uh, yeah, we'll do. I okay. think we are. We at ten? We got one more. Yeah, I think we got two more questions, and we'll do something cool. Okay, this is very strange. It happened to me many years ago, and it's haunted me ever since. I was at a professional baseball game. And all of a sudden, I see this ball coming toward me in slow motion. And I push my friend away, and I said, there's a ball coming. And it, I think it did come fast after past me. Did you ever hear anything like that? So you're saying that you, think, you believe that you were able to see it faster than you were? No, I saw it in slow motion. Oh, in slow and motion. then I pushed her away. I mean, th there's a lot of very strong illusions and distortions <laughs> of time that can occur. Um, you know, time perception is another whole type of perception that we didn't even talk about today. And, you know, a lot of that, you know, could be what you were experiencing then, given the emotional explosion that occurs when you see something like that occur. I mean, it was definitely not changing time. So it's a, you know, it's a perceptual phenomena that you were experiencing and it happens all the time, uh, you know, when you're, especially when your emotions are involved. Um, you know, we tend to feel that it, this, you know, it, it's a really cool point because it's reflective of the fact that what we want to believe is that there is a reality around us and that our perception is just allowing us to see it or to feel it and experience it and that it doesn't um, that, that that is the truth and that we are we are getting the real representation of that but that's not it um, our perception of time can be distorted through many different you know types of forces like strong emotions the ones you experience and our you know all of these everything we saw is ex you know proof that our perception is not really reality they're not one-to-one -one mapped upon each other so it's, it's such a, a strange feeling. yeah yeah so, so uh, I'm no neuroscientist but one time I have an experience where time slowed down and my way of explaining it away is just adrenaline, dopamine, blood going to the right places, reaction time changing. Everything yeah. felt like it slowed down and it was really weird and I could swear by it. But I, I've seen a study where they use a watch like on a roller coaster and yeah. they get time perception and they say time is fixed. Yeah. The <laughs> Yeah, time is fixed. Unless you're going into the edge of a black hole. Yeah. Well, this, this, then it slows down. We're supposed to be connecting some of this to real life. So there's another really profound and important way to change your perception of time. And that is attention. This has been well documented. So you know when you're driving home and your mind, you're not paying attention to anything, your mind is elsewhere, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm home already. Uh, that was like an hour and you, you lost all that time. But you don't always want to lose time, right? Sometimes you, you, you want to cher cherish the moment and like, make time last longer. And the way to do that, and the data is convincing that attention to the moment makes the perception of time longer. So if you want to have a, a richer, longer life, you really just have to pay attention to it. So yeah. that's, my, that's my longevity speech for today. And, and <laughs>
I'll, I'll add one more thing. Anecdotally, when I started to learn how to juggle, it just seemed like it's too much, too fast and all that, but just pure repetition slowing down. And when I was able to juggle five balls, I was able to just kind of slow down and, and see where the hand and think clearly and all that. So repetition, I think, gives the feeling of time slowing down, anecdotally. Yeah, hi. Michael, go ahead. <laughs> I'm not Michael. <laughs> Avi, go ahead. <laughs> that is not my name either. Okay. Um, I have a question for Adam, actually. <laughs> Could you explain to us a little bit the neuroscience of like procrastination? Is it related to the distractions, or is it more internal or sort of external type stuff? Asking for a friend? <laughs> what do you think? I mean, it, it, you know, it could be both. Uh, usually, you know, what, one of the things we did here, which is what we do in neuroscience, is we dissect things out. This happens externally, this happens internally, this is a distraction, this is an interruption. But usually they are all just piled upon each other um, uh, and, and they're, you know, sort of accumulating their effects. Um, so, you know, the act of, of procrastinating could be due to either, right? I mean, often uh, mind wandering and procrastination sort of related to that frequently is internally generated. So, you know, you have a lot going on in your head that may prevent you from interacting with the external world, but you could procrastinate externally as well. So, you know, it's really about having your goals um, being carried out effectively and how all of these forces, you know, so that's why I sort of broke that down to so start like paying attention in your own life when you have a really clear goal, like starting to do your homework, let's say, and you may find that you don't do it. What were the, what were the interference elements that led to that? Were, were they internal distraction? Were they external things that are introduced into your life? And that is a definitely, you know, great way of starting to take control over that. Cool. All right. Cool. So I'm going to close with teaching a magic trick. Hi, what's your name? I'm David. David. A big round of applause for David, everyone. <laughs> David, what do you do for a living? I'm a consultant in knowledge management. <laughs> it's a real great cocktail conversation. A knowledge consult sucks to be married to a guy who's a knowledge consultant. He knows everything. Uh <laughs> For uh, this closing effect, which I'm going to expose, I'm going to teach the secret to everyone, and I'll explain it very clearly if it makes it uh, to the podcast so people can make it and do it at home. Um, for the sake of this, would you be a bartender? Sure. Hey, bartender. Hey. Let's play a little game. It's called the three card Monty. I'm going to test your observation skills. First question, bartender, how many cards did I have? Looked like three. What were the colors of the cards? Red and black. How many red? Two. And one black? Yes. Okay, we'll play for beer. <laughs> Where is the black card? In the middle. We'll play for a beer? Sure. Okay, you won. We're not done, we're not done, we're not done. <laughs> Hold out your hand, bartender. I'm gonna place the middle card in your hand, place the other hand on top like a sandwich. Where are the two red cards? In your right hand. Would you like to play for 10 beers? No. Yes, I yes. you're up 11 beers, congratulations. For a million beers, where's the black card? In my hand. Go and look, it's a different one. <laughs> a big round of applause for my bartender, everyone. Thank you, you can have a seat. Watch your step. I can do this magic trick because I have a little secret extra flap here. Ah. So what I do is I take the uh, extra card, the joker, and I place it beneath the flap, like so, and I line up the top so it's one continuous line, and then I hide the edge of it with another card, and I place my hand down here to hide the, uh, the little extra stuff down here. And so what I've done is I've used pretty much all the concepts that Adam talked about today to create an illusion. This is really great. Uh, make them out of bicycle-sized playing cards. Keep them in your wallet. You'll be amazed. I had airport bars and hotel bars. Free drinks. I <laughs> they pour drinks all day and night. When you come in and have a, like a pattern disruption, you do something cool and you make them laugh and smile, they give you a free drink. Then I give them the, the, the cards and then I get another free drink. <laughs> Milkshakes. Milkshakes. <laughs> okay, so uh, just to review, I've got three cards and an extra flap. Now, the question I often get is, uh, 
how do you set it up in front of them without getting caught? And I'll tell you, just like we're talking about all this stuff here, the audience will remember what I'm interested in. Your eyes see everything, but you won't record what I'm disinterested in. So the wrong way to do it is this. Okay, I'm going to show you a magic trick, bartender. Hold on just one second, and I've got three cards. You know that there's something funny about it. I was tense, and I was focused here. But if I say, hey, bartender, where are you from? Los Gatos. Los Gatos. No kidding. I have three cards. I can sit up right in front of you. I'm not interested. I'm interested in something else. Your eyes see it, but your brain records what I'm interested in. And that's just yet another secret of how magicians trick yeah. audiences. Yeah, and that's a clear, clear example of you know, both information processing overload and internal distraction because trying to answer that question prevents his goal of trying to figure out what you're doing with your hands. So it's a, a pretty cool uh, example of showing how you can use internal distraction that you offer to create uh, interference with, with what's a pretty easy goal. You want to end with a quote? Yeah, let's end with it. So I think this is sort of a thought-provoking one. I can fool you because you're a human. You have a wonderful human mind that works no different from my human mind. Usually when we're fooled, the mind hasn't made a mistake. It's come to see wrong conclusions for the right reason. And that's magician Jerry Andrews. Oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you, thank everyone, you for, for your, your attention. attention.